Hello, and welcome to another edition of FNR Ask the Expert. Each week, we meet with you and try and fill you out on information on various topics. This week, we're talking about what is aquaculture. So if you don't know what that is, don't feel bad. We're going to tell you all about it today and how you may be able to use that on your local farm or even in a commercial capacity. So we're joined today by Bob Rohde, who is um, the lab manager for Purdue's Aquaculture Research Lab, and Amy Schombach, who is the Aquaculture Marketing Outreach Associate, save that five times fast, um, for Purdue University FNR and also Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, which is one of our great allied partnerships. So we're gonna start at the beginning, for those of you who don't know, what is aquaculture? So Amy, start us at the very basics and then we'll go from there and, and build as we go through. Just a reminder, if you have any questions as we go on, just put those in the question section or comment section here on Facebook and uh, Bob and Amy will answer them throughout the broadcast. Amy, take it away. Hey, thank you, Wendy. So aquaculture by definition is the breeding, rearing and harvesting of aquatic plants and animals and other organisms in all types of different water environments. So in Indiana, you're not gonna hear people call themselves aquaculturists. More common terms are water farmers, fish farmers, shrimp farmers, or shellfish farmers. So there's two basic types of aquaculture. There's marine aquaculture, which is known as mariculture. And that's when people farm aquatic animals that live in the ocean or estuaries. And I wanna mention that because Indiana's in the middle of the United States and we don't have marine coastline, but we do have farmers that are raising marine species in Indiana in indoor facilities. And so some other examples of marine aquaculture species that are raised are oysters, clams, mussels, um, and then fin fish like salmon, uh, black sea bass, and pompano. The second type of aquaculture is freshwater aquaculture. And that is when people are farming freshwater species. In the United States, some really common examples for that would be trout and catfish. So if basically aquaculture is farming in the water. Okay, that's, that's pretty cut and dried. Um, I guess Bob, a lot of people may not even know that this is something done quite a lot locally. And in fact, Purdue has their own aquaculture research lab, which you run. So can you tell us a little bit more about what Purdue does and Purdue FNR specifically does at that aquaculture research lab? Sure, the lab is located about 10 miles from campus. It's on the animal science research and extension farm. It's uh, got, <clears throat> facilities for both indoor production and out, outdoor and ponds. Um, and the name is a little bit of a misnomer. We do aquaculture research and uh, demonstration projects out here, but we also do um, other aquatic resource, uh, resource research related to fisheries and uh, other things like that out here as well. So it's all encompassing. It's not just aquaculture, it's uh, different aquatic animals. And like I said, we have indoor and outdoor facilities. Um, the indoors, we can do all kinds of fish uh, because we can regulate the temperature. And then outdoor, we're at the mercy of nature. So we have to do mostly native species out in the ponds. So now that we know Purdue does this and we know that it's, it's common practice for a lot of people and, and there's two different types, Amy, why don't you jump in and tell us some of the things you shared a little bit in your intro about um, some of the, the fish and other creatures that are grown um, through aquaculture. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I sure can. I'm going to have Bob share a slide for me on that so we can see some illustrations on what kind of critters are raised. The critters are one of my favorite things to talk about when it comes to aquaculture. So, is that showing up? It is. So the first group of animals I wanna talk about are fin fish. There are a lot of different kinds of fish that are raised in Indiana, depending on 
um, what the market is for that end product. But some things that we commonly see grown are tilapia. Um, tilapia is a very popular fish that's raised indoor uh, for a food fish market. We also have trout that is raised um, mostly indoor using cool water. And that's typically rainbow trout is the species that we see farmers raising in the state. There are several kinds of bass that are grown in Indiana. Largemouth bass is one of the most popular, but we also see smallmouth bass and hybrid striped bass raised as well. One of the more unique species that we have that's re recently being farmed is barramundi. So barramundi is not native to the United States. It's um, native to Australia. And so they, the farmers actually fly those eggs in and raise those in confined spaces um, where they can control the environment for those fish. There are a couple different kinds of persids that are really popularly raised in Indiana and in the Midwest. One is yellow perch and the other is walleye. We do see more farmers raising yellow perch than we do walleye um, at the moment, but there's a lot of interest for both. A broad category of fish that are raised are sunfish. Bluegill are really popular. Hybrid bluegill, which are a cross between a bluegill and another sunfish. Um, so other examples would be the red-eared sunfish. And um, sometimes we see green sunfish, but usually we see hybrid bluegill, bluegill, and red ear um, are some of the most popular of the sunfish that are raised. Bob, can you share the next slide with Sure. And so the other category we see farmers raising are shellfish, and that's where I brought up marine aquaculture is I think it's really interesting that farmers have chosen to farm saltwater species in Indiana. It's pretty common for a farmer to raise marine shrimp. They typically choose to raise the Pacific white-legged shrimp, which is sown in that upper left-hand corner. Um, and we have quite a few farms throughout the state and, a, and throughout the Midwest that are choosing that as their aquaculture species. Uh, we do have a farm in Indiana that's experimenting with oysters. So they're looking at co-raising marine shrimp and oysters in the same environment. Um, and they are raising those at slightly less salinity than, than a marine setting. The other shellfish that we see that's raised are crayfish. And I broke that into two different categories. So you can see on the lower left, that's an Australian red claw crayfish. And why I broke those up is there are farmers that are intentionally raise crayfish. So they choose that as their species. They purchase or breed those animals and then they raise those to the market. But then there are farmers that don't intentionally raise crayfish, but they wind up having crayfish as a crop when they harvest. And so that's typically in a, in a pond setting. So we have over 22 different taxa of crayfish that are found in Indiana. And when you put a pond in, sometimes you'll have native species that make your pond into their home. So then when you go and harvest those out, you not only have your fish, but then you also have um, a collection of crayfish as well. So those are just a few examples um, of the kinds of animals that farmers are currently raising for um, both for recreational use and for, for food fish in the state of Indiana. So as our favorite painter would say, Bob Ross, there are just happy little accidents. And uh, those might be some of those crayfish that pop up when you're actually farming fish. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and we got a shout out. I mean, he, he was in Muncie, for crying out loud, you know, and it, it was fitting. So um, yeah. just, you know, humor me for a moment. Um, so Bob, we did see Amy freezing her little tail off for us in the promo video that we saw earlier in the week. Um, braving the wind out there at the uh, research aqua, uh, aquaculture research lab. What is in those ponds? What, it, what are you guys raising um, this year out of the ARL? Um, well, historically, we do all kinds of research out there. Over the last several years, I've done mostly largemouth bass stuff. Um, and <clears throat> this year, I'll again do be doing largemouth bass. But um, in the last couple of years, we've put in a couple what we call teaching ponds with recreational pond socking management. 
that um, our students can use for a senior class project. And then lastly, this year, I'm hoping to do some, uh, get into walleye production. Um, like Amy said, there's a lot of interest and in, I'm trying to work with uh, feasibilities of what you can do on a, a simple to very complex level. So uh, we're just kind of puttering with them right now and then hopefully um, get a grant in the future to do some more intensive research on them. So that's the big plans for this year. So I guess you talked about, you know, everything from a small scale to commercial. So are ponds the only way for a farmer to farm fish in Indiana? Are there other methods? Um, I guess show us kind of the different methods that I may have to choose from if I choose to start an aquaculture farm, whether that's small scale or large scale. Sure. So um, I'll go on to a slide here that I've prepared. Um, so the easiest way to get into growing fish, especially if you own your own pond already, is to raise fish in cages. So this is an example. This is a commercial size cage. Um, you can stock probably upwards of 1,000 to 1,500 fish in a cage this size. Obviously, you're going to supplementally feed them and take care of them, and make sure they have good water quality. But it's definitely the, the least investment to get into the business, or even if you're going to do it for your own home consumption. If you already have a pond, um, this is definitely the way to go. And once you have it constructed, then you can set it out. Usually people have, this is a farm pond. This is actually a Purdue property in Southern Indiana where we do some cage culture down there. And uh, you can see they're pretty, um, what, inexpensive to get into other than the dock. It's uh, basically PVC pipe, plastic mesh, and some uh, swim noodles. And that's really all you need to get started at the very basic level. And then you can move up and get better materials to construct the, the cages. And uh, the cage I showed previously, that's used in a, what I call a highway pond, where there was a, two highways intersected, and then they had to build some overpasses. So they had a burrow pit that eventually filled with water. And the uh, person that leases that has like 20 or 30 large cages in that big water. It's like a 30 acre water body. So that's the easiest way to get her in, or the least expensive um, in terms of startup costs. So uh, the next way you can do it is in ponds. And this is one of our research ponds without any water. And the reason I have it in here is that an aquaculture pond should be specifically built for raising fish. It has that pipe you see is our fill pipe. Uh, the pipe behind that you can barely see is the drain pipe so we can evacuate all the water. And the levees themselves are nice and smooth with no stumps, no rocks. So you can pull a net through and harvest all your fish. So if you're gonna build a pond expressly for aquaculture, it has these characteristics. Uh, you can also do a hillside pond where you just throw up a dam across a little valley and then you collect rainwater to fill it. But those are not as manageable as something you can control like with a well. And this I'm gonna ask you a quick question there. Sure. How large does my pond need to be if I want to pursue aquaculture in it? Um, does it need to be an acre? Is there, it doesn't matter how many fish I want to raise. Um, right. What, what are the, right. the uh, so it's just like cattle or any other land animal, you have what we call stocking rates, how many fish you can grow per acre. And it depends on the size. If you're selling small fish to recreational pond owners, you can stock a lot more in a specific area. Or if you're doing food fish, obviously you're gonna reduce your stocking. So it does depend what your market is. But for commercial, I would think you want at least an acre per pond, if not two, and probably the, it's getting so, the largest ponds are now something on the order of five acres. Beyond that, it, it becomes kind of unmanageable and you need a lot bigger equipment, larger nets, larger equipment to manage it. So these ponds that I'm showing you are both our research ponds. They're very small. 
they're a quarter acre in size, and that's so we can get multiple ponds for research in a very small area. If this was a commercial operation, our 12 quarter acre ponds might realistically be two, two acre ponds. So yes, it, it's uh, very much a, a function of what you're wanting to produce. If your home consumption, a quarter acre pond is fine or even smaller potentially. So what are we seeing in this picture here? It looks like it's a little more advanced than the systems we saw previously. Right, so basically it's the same uh, type pond you saw, the, the pipe sticking up on the right is our fill pond, uh, pipe. The one on the left is our drain that's on a swivel and we can push it down. The ring around the pipe on the left is what we call a feed ring. Out here where we're located, it's very open, very flat, so we get a lot of wind. And the feed we feed the fish is generally floating. So if we don't try to manage it or corral it, sometimes we'll throw it in and it hits the shoreline before the fish even get a chance to eat it and it's wasted. So we have that floating ring. It's basically what you see there, it's probably sticks in the water two inches. So the fish can come up underneath it, grab the feed before it blows to shore and consume it. And then the other thing is what we call a pad wheel. If you're doing intensive production where you're adding feed, you get eutroph eutrophication of the water and you can have oxygen problems, especially in the early morning hours. So you have a, some type of supplemental aeration, in our case, a pad wheel, which comes on, lifts the water up in the air and adds oxygen to it and then, um, it creates a current in the pond to spread oxygen rich water throughout the pond. And that lets you increase your production. Okay. And then the last way to grow fish is indoors. Amy mentioned uh, about the marine shrimp being indoors. So basically um, this is the, the, what? The most expensive uh, means of raising fish in terms of startup costs because you need uh, not only tanks, but filtration equipment to clean the water as you're reusing it. In most cases, you're either heating or cooling the water. You wanna reuse that, that temperature and not have to be heating or cooling it continuously. So you need filtration to clean up the waste from the fish and the feed that goes into these units. Um, this is, a, I believe, a salmon farm in West Virginia. And uh, obviously, if you're doing it on a commercial scale, they need to be relatively large. Most of the pipes you see are probably six inch PVC pipes that are, um, so you can get a kind of a scale. And I don't know what the tanks are, but I would say probably 15 and 20 foot in diameter. The reason to grow indoors are multifaceted, but basically it's if you have a, animal that can't stand our winters like tilapia or marine shrimp that need uh, salt. You have to control that kind of thing, temperature. Or if it's uh, something that the Indian Department of Natural Resources wants you to control, so like invasive species, if it's a non-native species like the bear Monday, they're gonna want inside a building like this so that you don't have any escapes. So there's multiple reasons to do it, uh, and it's basically a financial consideration whether you can grow it successfully. And Great. those are that's the three ways you can grow fish: in cages in a existing pond or lake, uh, build your own ponds, or have an indoor system like this. Bob, one more thing I wanted to talk about before we let Amy sure. share some of the aquaculture products. Um, we have also some, an aquaponics experiment um, that's going on over there um, at the ARL. Um, what can you tell us? I know I'm not. We're, we'll have a whole nother discussion on aquaponics a different day. But what can you, uh, what can you tell us a little bit? Just scratch the surface for us about aquaponics and what we're doing at ARL. Yeah, sure. So aquaponics is just a is a takeoff. Um, it's a combination of hydroponics which is raising plants in water with chemical solutions and uh, 
recirculating aquaculture systems, which is the last slide I showed, an indoor system. And basically what you're doing is you're using the waste products from the fish in the water to grow the plants. And the plants take up nutrients that clean up the water for the fish. So um, basically it's a win-win in that you're cleaning up your water for the fish and yet you're still producing some a byproduct, which is the vegetables, flowers, whatever, in your, your plant production area. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that people are looking at in terms of su sustainability, trying to get, you know, use as much of what we put in and not have waste on the other end of the process. Awesome. Um, so Amy, I'm going to toss it to you because this is a big part of your job is the aquaculture marketing outreach. Um, tell us about some of the products that are locally produced here in Indiana, because I know a lot of people probably don't think about the Midwest and fish and shrimp and crayfish and all of these things. That's true. And the products can actually be broken into categories. So a lot of times people think about seafood and fish as something that we're gonna eat, um, but there's also people that are growing fish for, for other reasons. So the four different categories of aquaculture products that are raised in Indiana are ornamentals. And so that is mostly going to be something that you would find at the pet store. So goldfish, koi, something that you might stock in your water feature um, in your backyard. Um, so that's one option. Uh, bait fish is grown for um, the recreational fisheries. And so if you're looking for live bait, something like a minnow, that's also could be an aquaculture species. Pond stalkers are really popular. So if you have a private pond and you're looking at stalking kids, so your fish, excuse me, so your grandkids could catch them, um, that is done through pond stalking. And um, people pond stock for different reasons. And I know that Mitch has been on talking about pond management, but that's one of the people that you can get those fish from are, are suppliers that are doing raising fish just for private pond stocking. And then that fourth category is, is food fish. And so a lot of the food that's raised in Indiana um, is raised for the live market, but we have some that is raised for retail too. Uh, we do have a lot of, our number one food fish species is tilapia, and those are sold to the live market, mostly ethnic, um, but you can find them in some other places sometimes too. Rainbow trout is a popular food fish, and that's typically processed and sold into restaurants or retail markets. So sometimes you can find them in your, your local um, grocery store or even like at a farmer's market or directly from the farmer. So most of our farmers do sell off their farm as well as to wholesalers or retailers. Um, and then we did mention marine shrimp, which is something that always blows my mind that you can find a marine animal that's raised in the middle of a cornfield in Indiana. Um, you, when you're driving down the road, typically you just see a barn, maybe with a flag or something, but it just, it's uh, mind blowing to think about how innovative farmers can be. Um, and so there are a lot of cool products that farmers are raising. I would say that we probably have a bigger pond stocking industry um, by number of fish sold than we do for food fish. Um, but we also, Indiana has one of the largest goldfish farmers in the US, which is also a fun thing to know. Um, and then those farms are not only providing fish to sell the public, but a lot of them are interested in education. So we have farms that are doing ag tourism that welcome the public um, into their facility, mostly by appointment, um, so that they can show you how they grow their fish. Um, and some of them even provide like consulting services. So there's really a lot that fish farmers are doing in Indiana. Uh, one of the things that Illinois Indiana Sea Grant is doing is we're working on a project to try and help um, consumers and fish farmers connect. So there is a online resource hub called Eat Midwest Fish. And that's a place where you can find information, anything from 
health and safety recipes, cooking videos. If you want to find a fish supplier in your region that's doing a food fish, um, you can open up the fish finder map and, and see who's growing fish near you and find out a little bit more about how to contact those, those suppliers. And if you're short on recipes every Friday, Eat Midwest Fish um, tweets out or posts uh, a new recipe that you might want to try. So um, if you need recipes for the weekend, certainly they can help you out with that. Um, <laughs> but so Bob, Amy mentioned that a lot about fish uh, pond stocking and, and Mitch, as she, Mitch Ziske, as she mentioned, has talked a lot about pond stocking in terms of pond management. So if I'm a local resident and I want to stock my pond for this spring, which obviously is coming up as the thaw is happening, um, where can I find a supplier to buy fish from locally? So there's a couple options. Uh, the easiest is to go to the Indiana DNR website and they have a commercial fish suppliers list. And that is all the producers and retailers who are licensed in the state and each operation will have its address and what fish they have are available and so in some cases you might want multiple species and have to uh, select for somebody that will cover those species or more preferably if you can find somebody close logistically where you can go and pick up the fish and bring them to your home that'd be the the best option the other thing I find or try to tell people is go to your local feed and seed because um, they usually have a list of uh, suppliers who are going to stop by once a month, once every two months during the spring to fall period. Um, usually it's a relatively large truck with multiple um, tanks on it and they'll have multiple species and you can just go there. They're going to be relatively small fish. They'll bag them up in plastic bags with water and oxygen, and you can take them home that way. It's just a, it's only like one Saturday a month or something. So you have to time it correctly, but it's usually somewhere that, that these kind of fish are available. So that's the two I would recommend is the DNR list and then your local feed and seed. It's great information. Um, I know there's a lot of people looking forward to getting some good fish in those ponds. <laughs> Uh, coming up. But as Mitch said, if you if you did not watch the pond management um, session a few weeks ago, uh, go back and watch it. You may not need to be stocking your pond. More fish is not always the answer. I'm sure Bob <laughs> has um, certainly some opinions on that. Um, just a reminder too, if you have questions about some of these things, put those in the comment section here on Facebook and Bob and Amy can answer them as we go along. Um, moving along, um, you talked about private fish suppliers um, then that, you know, DNR has some of these resources and also your local feed and seed. But I've heard about state-run fish, ha fish hatcheries. Um, can you tell me a little bit about those that are maybe accessible, Amy? Yeah, so like Bob said, if you're a private landowner and you're looking at stocking fish, you're gonna buy those from a private business. Um, but the Indiana, State Department of Natural Resources, they have state-run hatcheries. And the purpose of those hatcheries are to, to help stock public waterways. So when you're angling at public um, and, well, state and public waterways, a lot of times there is a team of people that is managing that population. And part of managing that is adding to that population as we take the fish out. Um, so Indiana has, 17 different state-owned hatcheries and they're raising it depends on the year but they raise about 16 different species of fish so they're doing both cool cold and warm water fish so depending where the hatchery is and what the water temperature is kind of depends on what fish they might be raising and i'll have wendy share a resource in the box so if you are interested in touring a facility, you can go to those hatcheries um, based on appointment and they will take you through the, the facility and teach you about not only what kind of fish they're raising, but how those fish are used to uh, stock our public waterways to enhance the experience of anglers. Um, and they raise all sorts of cool fish. So they're Northern pike, salmon, um, muscaline, 
yellow perch, trout, um, you name it, they probably raise it there. And Bob, we have we can't talk about raising anything or having ponds or any type of um, outdoor thing here in Indiana or any state for that matter without talking about invasive species. Um, we talked a little bit about that with Mitch and some of the plant management that you have to do when you have a pond, but I'm sure that it's even more elevated um, when you're talking about raising fish and in a pond for, especially even for commercial use or beyond recreational use. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things I might be worried about um, invasive species wise uh, with aquaculture? Sure. So um, the first thing we tell people, you know, to have a good plan if you're going to get into the business. And one of those things to check out is the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Not only do they produce fish, but they also regulate what can be grown here in the state. And every fish producer uh, can get a license. It's free of charge. And they have two different types of licenses. One is the called the fish haulers permit, and it covers 38 pre-approved species. So these are all the species you can raise here in the state without any issue at all because they're all natives. Then they have another permit called the aquaculture permit. And this is more for the species that are non-native, potentially invasive. So if you wanna raise Bear Monday or uh, I'm trying to think what another one is. We had somebody a few years ago interested in raising eels or Atlantic salmon, I think are on that list as well. Then you would apply for this permit. And in order to get, obtain that permit, which again is cost free, you would need to have some sort of, they're going to want to see a plan how you're not going to let any of these potentially invasive species get loose. Uh, and usually that's a technological issue, uh, some kind of barriers or techniques to keep them from uh, escaping. And so that, because that is their job is to protect the wild areas of the state, not just supplement them with fish, but also protect what's already there. So it's, uh, and I will say that the Indian and DNR in general is very pro-business so that um, you'd have to, not do your homework in order to not be approved pretty much. Uh, there's plenty of technological ways of making sure that invasive species don't get out. There's double, triple barriers. So um, if you do your homework, they probably will approve you. There is one or two issues that they're gonna be really um, wanting to know if you're importing fish from overseas, such as the Bear Monday, you're going to have to have your fish health certified by whatever legal entity that is in the um, country of origin. So it can get pretty complicated, but it is doable. But the bottom line is protecting the environment that's already here and the native species that are already here. Well, we definitely know all about invasive species. One thing we want to talk about too is if you're going from pond to pond, and I'm sure that um, you guys have heard us say this every week that we talk about this. If you're going from pond to pond, you're going from woods to woods, make sure you're changing your boots, cleaning your gear, all of those type of things to make sure that we're not spreading invasives from your property to your neighbors. Because the last thing we want is uh, somebody to have a bad experience. And the next thing you know, it's spread all through that countryside because you didn't clean your boots or you moved wood or you, um, you know, put your boat in a pond and then put it in another pond and, and had an issue. So um, certainly don't want to um, to spread invasive species if we can help it. Um, and there's some information about aquatic plant management. We have a publication on that that I will put uh, in the comment section as well. Um, we do have a question from the audience um, and I'm gonna recommend uh, to John that you check out our um, Ask the Expert from a few weeks ago with Mitch Ziski about pond management specifically. Um, and we talked a lot about fish stocking, um, but if Bob, you wanna tackle a little piece of this one based on your experience, um, the gentleman has a five acre lake, um, it's 50 years old, he's added fish, he only purchases small fish, um, but he's wanting to bring in new fish stock to improve fish health. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit to your experience and then we can also um, 
obviously share other uh, resources we have. Sure. Um, yes, and something like that where there's already existing fish, you're probably going to, it's fine to bring in other fish, they're just going to need to be larger, which means more expensive. Um, and in terms of um, the idea of new fish, it, it is good to bring in new different fish from different stocks every once in a while, um, just to spread out the genetic variability in your population and give you more chance of survival. Um, a lot of times people keep buying the same fish from the same person year after year after year, and it kind of can stunt your growth um, on your fish because the genetics are not very wide. So it's not a bad idea if you are gonna bring in new fish, number one, have them bigger, and number two, get them from a source you haven't used in the past. So as we move along, um, if you have any further questions there, John, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We can put you in touch with Mitch or Bob or anybody and, and try and help you specifically with um, your questions there. Um, but I guess if people have learned something today and we've piqued their interest, whether that's um, just farming in their own local um, residential pond for to put food on their plate or to grow some cool goldfish as Amy told us about, which I honestly did not know Indiana stocked a lot of goldfish. Um, so we maybe all learned something today. Um, if you're interested in pursuing aquaculture, whether just as a hobby or a business, what advice um, do you guys have for those folks? Amy, I'll start with you. I My number one advice is do your homework. So um, Aquaculture, like any business, um, there there is stuff to learn with it, and you want to make sure that you're making informed decisions. So do some background reading. It's really good to reach out and meet farmers in your area and learn from their experiences um, so you don't repeat the same mistakes that they made. A lot of times um, they can give you great advice and you can see what's working and, and what's not. Um, but yeah, that's my number one tip is do your homework. Bob, I guess we'll let you jump in then. Um, I have pretty much the same thoughts. I think um, it's really important. A lot of times we get hooked on the technology and the great idea of having fish in water and raising them. But what's probably more important than anything is where are you going to sell them? if you're doing it commercially. If it's for your own home consumption, that's uh, that's great. I think it's a part of a really healthy diet, but if you're looking at it commercially, um, you need to make sure you're gonna be able to sell them when you get done with them, uh, whatever that point is, either when they're small or when they're large. But it's a lot of times people uh, tend to get hung up on the technology and it's not just the technology, it's also the marketing and business aspects that are, that's, that tends to trip people up. And if you want to be successful, that's where I would make sure you put a little bit of personal emphasis. Yeah, and our, um, our colleague, Dr. Quagrani, he would, he would say, make sure to put that in the beginning of your business planning. So you, there's big decisions to be made. You've got to decide how you're going to grow them, what fish you're going to grow, but how you're going to market them. And if um, you're not growing a fish that you can make money at, then commercially, it's not really a viable business. Um, so really, um, you got to do a lot of reading and talk to a lot of people um, before you make those critical decisions for your business. And I know there's some resources out there to help folks along the way, um, some different partners that we have that Illinois Indiana Sea Grant has as well. Um, can you guys mention some of those places where people can go to get um, information as they start this process? Go ahead, Amy. Okay, so um, I, recommends um, the State Aquaculture Association. So Indiana has an aquaculture association. That's a good way to meet other farmers. Um, for reading materials, my first go-to is usually one of the racks. So the in the United States, there's different um, aquaculture regions that have um, regional aquaculture centers. The Southern Regional Aquaculture Center has a great library of fact sheets. And I'm amazed. You can read anything from raising an alligator to the 
chemistry of water to how to market and sell something. So they have a really good um, set of um, resources. And then also the NICRAC, which is the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, has publications. And their research and publications are really focused on our region. So they have things like the Yellow Perch Culture Manual and a Sunfish Culture Manual. So a lot of things that are um, apply to specific species that are of interest in our region. And then um, the Department of Natural Resources is always high on the list. So one of the first questions you ask yourself is, I want to raise this fish, but can I legally raise it in our state? And how can I legally bring it in? So it's good to look at their resources um, on what fish you can raise um, in the state and also what it would take to bring a fish in. So for example, we, we live in a state that touches the Great Lakes. So if I'm bringing a fish into the state of Indiana from another state that touches the Great Lakes, I also have to go through the Board of Animal Health. And they just wanna make sure that we're not bringing in any diseases. So like the Department of Natural Resources is looking at um, protecting our native waters and the Board of Animal Health is also looking at protecting the health of the fish that are in our state. Um, so those are good resources too. And that's where I would usually start. Bob, you do this and have been doing this for a long time. Um, a lot of times we learn from our mistakes and I'm sure that that's happened as you're doing a lot of research. Um, anything you want to leave folks with, um, maybe do's and don'ts or, um, you know, just encouragement as they embark on this process? Um, if you, the, the most successful people I've seen are people who have worked with animals in the past. Uh, a fish, my, what I tell students who come here is my job as manager is no different than the manager over at the swine unit, is no different than the manager at the dairy unit. We all come in in the morning, we go, we look at our animals, we see what kind of health they're in, we start feeding them, we're looking at our equipment. Our days are exactly the same, it's just that my, my animals are a little more hidden than their animals. But anybody who's raised animals in the past they have a pretty good shot of raising fish um, or shrimp or whatever, uh, because it's about husbandry. It really is. And that's the secret. Anything you want to add, Amy, as we wrap up, you guys have given us a lot of information to think about. All of those resources they mentioned are in the comment section here on Facebook. So um, if you want to do some digging and learn about how to raise some alligators, um, go yeah. for it. I wouldn't recommend doing that in Indiana. Um, <laughs> may not be a popular choice among your neighbors, but um, Amy, anything you want to wrap up with? I think I would just add to um, Bob's thought is don't be afraid to start small. So several of the successful aquaculture businesses in our state have started small and they've grown as they've learned um, how to operate the system and the biology of the animal and then they add on to um, as they go. So don't be afraid to start small. And don't be afraid to reach out for help. I think that would be absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. So if you need help, um, certainly you can go on um, the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant page, Eat Midwest Fish. Um, Bob is available through our website, also our Purdue Extension Specialist, um, Mitch Ziske, as we've mentioned several times today, um, does a lot with the pond stocking and fish management um, that way. So uh, we hope you learned a little bit about aquaculture today. And um, if you're interested in dipping your toe in the water or learning more, certainly check out those resources and reach out to us. We'd ha be happy to help. Um, as for Ask the Expert, we'll be back in two weeks. We're going to be talking about another critter, as Amy says, you might see in the pond, uh, frogs and toads. So we'll be joined by Dr. Rod Williams, Dr. Jason Hooverman, and Michael Lanou at 3 p.m. So adjust your clock a little bit. We're going a little later uh, so you can eat lunch and then come back and join us to talk frogs and toads. Uh, so March 18th, 3 p.m., uh, frogs and toads, and we will see you there. So uh, thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.